Congressman Perrin James Mitchell was born on April 29, 1922, in Baltimore, Maryland. One of seven children, Mitchell was raised in a large family. As a child, Mitchell was witness to his brother Clarence Mitchell's political and civil rights activism. Mitchell frequently credited his brother's unwavering dedication to the American Civil Rights Movement with his own pursuit of racial equality. Following the lynching of George Armwood in Princess Anne, Maryland, which would become the last lynching in Maryland, Mitchell observed his brother Clarence's immense distress as a result of having witnessed the gruesome scene. After Clarence recalled the event for his family, Perrin resolved to take up the fight for racial equality. Mitchell graduated from Frederick Douglass Senior High School in 1940, then served as an officer in the United States Army's 92nd Infantry Division during World War II. Mitchell received the Purple Heart Award for injuries sustained during combat in Italy. After returning stateside, Mitchell earned his bachelor's degree from Morgan State University, a traditionally black college in Baltimore, Maryland. It was Mitchell's intention to earn a graduate degree that set his sights on the University of Maryland, which was, at that time, a whites-only institution. Mitchell was said to have stood on the shoulders of those before him, following the footsteps of several individuals who had filed suit to access an equal education as whites in Maryland. This university in the state of Maryland owe an enormous debt of gratitude uh, to Perrin Mitchell. Uh, he showed enormous courage in being the first African American to come to this campus and uh, graduate uh, with a graduate degree. He could have taken the quiet path of uh, just disappearing into the background or just accepting the world the way it was or simply saying, well, um, I will just study in a second rate uh, place or I will just be uh, getting my degrees without coming to the university. Instead, he chose the principal path, which was to say, no, I am going to fight for my rights, which are the rights of my people and therefore the fight for the rights of any human being. When Perrin Mitchell becomes uh, part of the series of suits that the NAACP was promulgating to uh, have students of color admitted to the university, uh, he had just graduated from Morgan State College and was looking to obtain a graduate degree. He became aware of those lawsuits because he was a Baltimorean and that a lot of that activity was emanating from the city of Baltimore and became party to one of those suits and that was what resulted in the writ of mandamus that forced his admission into the university. Perrin Mitchell was admitted um, in the aftermath of a writ of mandamus that was issued by the, the court in Baltimore. Uh, the university realized that they really did not have another legal leg to stand on so uh, his admission proceeded with, with pace uh, immediately after that writ was issued. Uh, from what I understand from looking at newspaper accounts at the time uh, his arrival on campus was not uh, greeted with any amount of hostility. Uh, I don't think he felt very welcome here, on, uh, on the other hand, because people were not very friendly or outgoing to him, but there wasn't any kind of overt action uh, that prevented him from attending class in any way. When Perrin Mitchell arrived on campus in 1951, there were actually very few students of color here. Our first African-American undergraduate student, a young man named Hiram Whittle, enrolled in the spring of 1951, just as Perrin Mitchell did. At the end of the spring semester in 1951, three African-American students received their master's degree in education, Rose Shockley Weissman, Myrtle Holmes Wake, and John Francis Davis. The differentiation between those three students and Perrin Mitchell's role in our history is that they were required to take all of their classes off campus and the only day they ever stepped on the campus here in the College Park was graduation day in the spring of 51. So Perrin Mitchell plays in a very important role in our history because he is the first African-American graduate student to take all of his classes on our campus and receive a graduate degree. It's, it's a pivotal event uh, in terms of uh, race relations and higher education in the 21st century. Uh, Congressman Mitchell's willingness to bring suit against the University of Maryland in order to become a graduate student in sociology, uh, his courage in doing that, and the fact that he ultimately prevailed uh, really marked a watershed moment in the university's history. Uh, because of Perrin and his courage, uh, this university actually became integrated 
uh, before Brown versus uh, Board of Education. So in a way, it gave College Park a head start on the uh, integration, which of course should have occurred many years uh, pr prior to that. So one of the things that I think is remarkable about Congressman Mitchell is the breadth of his career path. Uh, st stimulated by um, a master's degree in sociology that he earned here, he went on to direct uh, human relations organizations in Baltimore, and then went on, of course, to run for c Congress and uh, serve for, I believe, 16 years. And it really, I think, speaks to our campus's commitment to do groundbreaking research and to develop scholars. We want our graduate students to be scholars and researchers who contribute to their fields. But it also speaks to our commitment to service. Uh, we are a public land-grant university, and I think Congressman Mitchell's career path is really uh, emblematic of the ideal to which we aspire. And I think one of the important legacies that we have had a succession of presidents where, where diversity, cultural diversity, has been a part of the ethos of, of the University of Maryland over the years, and I see that really sort of continuing. I think his legacy and his legacy and legacy of individuals like him have opened up a landscape of critical thinking about ways in which we um, think about the kind of research topics that one can look at, the individuals who are engaged in research processes, um, so more faculty of color from a diverse group of community um, backgrounds, um, the kinds of lines of scholarship that students can now see themselves in. Uh, the University of Maryland uh, at, at College Park uh, has now, f since that time, has, has evolved into one of the most diverse uh, institutions uh, in, uh, among all the major research universities in America. And when you look at the diversity of this institution and the great record ha it has in that regard, really a model for other uh, universities, in higher, uh, universities in America, um, you can trace back this commitment, this tradition, really, to the days of Perrin Mitchell and uh, his, cur his courage in coming to the university. Sixty-three years ago, uh, for some of us, may not seem that long ago, but for others, can seem like ancient history. I think for many of our students in particular, it can seem like ancient history. And I think it's important because we need to be reminded of the valiant struggles and fights and activism that have led us to the diversity that we have today. And we need to be mindful of the fact that the struggle isn't over, that the integration of this campus didn't mark the end of racism, didn't mark the end of lesser opportunities for students from underrepresented groups. Uh, it was highly important. It changed the game. but. Even though we've had tremendous strides in the ensuing 63 years, we still have some inequities that need to be corrected. We still have a ways to go to create a fully diverse, equitable, and inclusive university. He was fearless before fearless became our caption, our words at this institution. He was um, determined probably by a set of um, ways in which his spirit spoke to him if folks understand that, that he didn't need permission. Um, you know, I think he probably had what a lot of people have had, which is the understanding deep within him that this wasn't just about him. And so I think he was opening up a legacy that we today could celebrate, but that not only today, my child and other people's children will continue to think about that kind of fearlessness. The president at the time, Byrd, had arranged for him to do his graduate work in Baltimore, away from campus. And he said, oh no, oh no. Uh, that would have been easier, might have been more comfortable, uh, but he really decided that that wasn't acceptable, and it wasn't acceptable for him or for those of us who follow behind him. I think there's no better example of fearlessness than, than what Congressman Mitchell did for all of us. One of the things that uh, this university rightfully takes uh, great pride in 
is the creativity, the boldness, the courage of the ideas that are generated from uh, members of our community. Uh, you, you think about uh, Jim Henson in the, in the Muppets or Sergey Brin in Google. Uh, but in that category, you have to place Perrin Mitchell uh, because of uh, his bold idea to integrate the University of Maryland College Park to, to overcome all sorts of obstacles to come here and be a student at the University of Maryland. You know, you might even say he was the original fearless Terp. In October 2015, the Board of Regents at the University System of Maryland unanimously approved the naming of the Art Sociology Building after the late Congressman Perrin Mitchell. The Perrin Mitchell Art Sociology Building will stand as a tribute to the enduring legacy of Congressman Mitchell and will inspire countless students, faculty, staff, and alumni.